Hello friends, as promised earlier in June, here's the video about that one other video that I've made. Well, as usual, I'll be explaining the thought and design processes behind everything, I'll be doing shot by shot breakdowns. And hopefully this time, I'm gonna try to make my video more entertaining and more condensed than the previous ones. And you can make it even denser yourself by using the playback speed option. Let's get into it. Before we jump into the thick of it, a quick word on why I made this in the first place. It was a few things coming together. First, back during the International 2015, the two finalists for the yearly Arcana vote were Queen of Pain and Zeus. The latter won. Second, at the time, I was also listening to a band I hadn't paid attention to since I was four. The Police. Back then, in elementary school, we'd have this sort of games fair at the end of every year, called Kermes in French, and there were prizes to win. I won an audio tape of the Synchronicity album by being really good at fishing for plastic ducks. Third, I saw this old drawing by a friend, and all of this kind of clicked together and I started getting lots of ideas really fast. Character design is a tricky thing. In the case of Dola, while the game features, in my opinion, much better designs than its competitors, it compromised certain of them for fan service purposes. And so, in setting to create the male version of Queen of Pain, I figured it should be, in the end, as clean of a gender swap as possible. Much like the Queen is this attractive succubus that's pandering to guys, the King should be pandering to women and bi slash gay guys as well. After showing the drawing that sparked the idea to a dozen or so people representative of this target audience, what became very clear was that it wasn't attractive. It came off as more of a parody, a joke, than anything else. What came back the most was, it's too drag. In hindsight, it was quite obvious. He shouldn't have the same exact clothes as his counterpart. And so, the design was iterated upon and upon, until the final result. We settled upon a magic mic kind of stripper body, not too muscular. Guys often think that 100 pounds of muscle mass is what is sexy to most women, but it's really not. Well, no one, especially me, a guy, can speak for all women, of course. But my conclusion after this empirically driven design process is that fan service for women leans a lot more towards the Edward Cullen end of the scale. Nice sharp facial features, deep eyes, a toned body, not necessarily muscular, an Apollo's belt and of course a defined butt with shape. The body only does half the work though. What makes someone attractive is how they behave and so that other half would be defined later in animation. I've seen a lot of guys assume that the male and female characters of Dota are equally sexualized, equating the gratuitous cleavage on most female heroes with the fact that heroes like Axe, Beastmaster, etc. are shirtless hunks of muscle, but it's a staggeringly huge false equivalency. Really, if you want to make fan service for women, it's not hard. All you've got to do is ask them. Involving them in the process is even better, of course. It's Stephanie Everett, who most Dota players familiar with the workshop know as Anuxi, who modeled the king. Overall, the design was treading quite a few thin lines. Being a parody versus being something badass that can stand on its own. Being fan servicey enough versus having substance, not that the two are mutually exclusive but they tend to repel each other. And having an actually sexualist guy versus not getting too much of the Latin homophobic reactions that tend to surface when you have sexualized male designs. There's a lot more I could say on the subject but I'm not sure how to phrase it and I don't think it's this video's place to linger on it for too long. We could have gone a bit further and made him more scantily clad, especially for the pants, and we could have given him some more muscular thighs instead of going towards lean in order to maximize sex appeal, but when all's said and done, I think we settled in a place that's reasonably close to the ideal goal, and in their current form the pants allow this gem to truly shine. I love this gem, I really do. You can make so many puns with it. They're the family jewels. Diamonds are a girl's best friend, and of course, hard as a rock. And I've gotta say, I have really polished the hell out of this gem. Two custom shader masks and a custom cube map just for this bad boy right here. It's the equivalent of whatever the hell these two things are in Queen of Pain's belt. The King's head is loosely based on Sting. Who is Sting? Well, you've heard him in the video because he's the Polish's lead singer. And to be more specific, it's loosely based on how Sting appears in the music video for Synchronicity 2. And I don't mean just his facial features, but his hair too. Except it's encompassed by horns now and black. But still, the aim was to have a loose resemblance, a bit of a connecting thread of sorts. Side by side, you can kinda tell, and that's the point. 
Now, something else that's more vague, but hopefully you see what I'm getting at. The queen's face is unmistakably feminine, but it also has more masculine features than the other women of the game. Likewise, I wanted the king's face to blur the lines a bit and then make up for it with makeup. More on that in a minute. It's a part I find interesting. Both characters are the gender and sex binary taken to an extreme, except the face. By the way, we also referenced Thing for the Body. It was based on his appearance in David Lynch's 1984 adaptation of Dune. Last thing to mention here, they have the same eyes. I remember Anuxi tried different ones at some point, but it looked really odd, so I reverted to the original ones at like 90%. Eyes in games are notoriously tricky. Remember the Mass Effect Andromeda issues? You need to have the glint, these reflections in the eye. However, Dota 2 has no eye shader unlike other Source games. Back then, it was special shaders who were in charge of going all out on the eyes, adding reflection maps, bumps for the cornea, ambient occlusion and glint. The glint is very powerful. Eyes are shiny, and so, thankfully, even though Dota 2 has none of the eye shader fanciness, all you really need is to paint the glint straight into the eyes. Observe what happens if I take it out. Creepy, right? And even though the glint moves with the eyes, which it shouldn't, and that the glint is straight up mirrored across both eyes, which it really shouldn't be, it doesn't matter, because that's enough for our brains to not see their eyes as creepy, lifeless things. Akasha, that's the queen's name, by the way, has these things on her face. Makeup? Tattoos? Face paint? Whatever it is, the king needed those too. But we had to come up with something original and which felt distinctly masculine, while also highlighting his features, artificially sharpening them, much like how makeup could. Christian Gramness, whom you might know as Chiz, the artist behind many great sets, designed a bunch of tattoos. I picked a mix between 3 and 8 with a couple of small tweaks. I liked the result so much that I asked him to design tattoos for his chest as well. The reason for this being, even though he has this sort of mini leather jacket top thing, his chest is more empty. Well, that's kind of an awkward phrasing, but you know what I mean. The chest tattoos serve as a way to bridge the gap a little. Through shutter masks, I also added some solid glint to them. Now onto the arms. His shoulder pads are pretty much a verbatim copy of hers. And I'm not sure what she's supposed to have on her forearms. Could it be latex gloves? Something vaguely fetishy? Either way, the more masculine version of that ended up being henna wraps. They end in this way to mirror how her whatever they are things tear apart here. The wings are the same. Wings are tricky to make rig and animate, so why bother making new ones when hers fit him just as well? Doing this allowed me to reuse, mix and match crop swing animations in some places. His are actually scaled up a bit to reflect the fact that he's taller than her by about a head. Unfortunately, he doesn't have the weird bony back thing that the queen has. I forgot about that until it was way too late. So we just added those flesh bumps under the bone parts. Facial animation is still tricky. Not much has changed since my first short, adding magic aspiration. While there's a DMX plugin currently being developed for 3ds Max, we're still unable to write facial animation rules metadata into our models. So it was best to keep it simple, otherwise I'd have to start tracking a lot of different animation channels, including for right and left parts of the face. So I omitted that left and right separation for a bunch of the mouth shapes, and in general, kept the set of shapes narrowed down. While tech artists these days do all sorts of really fancy things in order to set up facial capabilities as fast and as accurately as possible, I did it all by hand. It was a bit tedious, because you want to make sure you're going to do the right thing as closely as you can. Any error that sneaks in will be compounded when many ships enter the playing field at once. Which, believe me, they will. I had to be especially careful with regards to the tattoos. Any deformation must fade away from its main area very gracefully, especially near the tattoos. In summary for the design process, the priority was to reason according to the final original Queen of Pain, and then try to get as close to the exact male equivalent that could have been produced. I would say that was the core principle. If it was official, what would it look like? Of course, I don't wish to pretend for a second that our art is up to the quality of what Valve staff can do, but it obviously doesn't hurt to, in a way, try to think like them. In fact, with a couple of exceptions, he was made and set up the same way as a regular hero model. However, with all that polish made on the king, his counterpart also needed some attention. 
I've put it up before that the rigging can be subpar on some older Dota heroes, especially those that were released during the initial catching up with Warcraft 3 Dota period of the game. Unfortunately, Queen of Pain is among those affected. For example, her fingers are very incorrectly weighted. But there's also, well, let me go on a tangent here for those among you who may not know this already. Remember what I said earlier, how Dota doesn't have an eye shader? Hero meshes also don't have eyes, in the conventional sense. It's very much an optimization thing. After all, it's a top-down game, so there's not much point in fully modeling out the tiny things, right? And it's a decision that does make sense as far as the top-down gameplay camera angle is concerned. I personally disagree with it because you only need the fully modeled eyes in the LOD 0 and the gameplay uses the lower detailed LOD 1 anyway, so they really could have stuck a couple of half spheres in the LOD 0. It's not that many triangles. With eyes topologized the way they are, they can't be moved around without distortion. But there's another decision that compounds this problem. You see? Facial morphs are automatically generated with, as far as I know, fancy internal Maya tools that were created by Bayret. It's a time-saving part of Dota's character creation pipeline which, again, makes sense, but was sometimes not cared for enough. So the morph shapes can behave oddly on occasion. The most recent heroes do have fully modeled eyes, but things can still look kinda weird. Anyway, to get back to Queen of Pain, her eyes do not work. At all. Thankfully, I was struck by an idea which, quite frankly, I'm embarrassed for not coming up with sooner. The idea is to duplicate the eyes and then move them a little bit outwards, then creating an outer loop that will be the equivalent of the rest of the sphere of the eyes. It doesn't really matter what UV space is associated to that outer loop of geometry, but it's a good idea to use whatever padding valve artists left. And last, the eyes will be rigged to three bones, the head and one new bone for each eye. Eyes with bones are pretty useful because you can drive them with aim constraints. While the same can be achieved with morph targets, it's a much more fancy process and one that's outside the scope of SFM2. Using aim constraints in SFM2 has some limits though. It offers nowhere near the same amount of control that you'd get in dedicated 3D animation software. It can be a little off. The aim center is based on the rotation at the time you hooked up the constraint and the up vector is considered to be the same as the target instead of the parent of the bone that is constrained. In layman's terms, that means rolling the head results in... Um, interesting results? Although it's a bit troublesome, there's a way to filter the offending axes out. By using a second copy of the eyes, locking it to the first, then unlocking those transforms as a way to bake the final constraint data onto itself. Then, the graph editor can be used to zero out the data on one axis. It's not a perfect solution and it's definitely a gross hack, but much like how simple patent glint on the eyes makes a lot of difference, being able to have actual eye motion is an enormous upgrade, even if it's sometimes a bit off. To further prove my point, check out the difference it makes on the intro sequence. You want me? <laughs> Come to think of it, where's the pleasure in that? The queen is dead. Long live the king. Unfortunately, there was nothing that I could do at the time about her hands. I discovered a solution while making my TI-7 short film, but I'll talk about that in the behind the scenes video for that one. It's time for the shot by shot breakdown. I'll be, well, breaking down every shot into its individual components in SFM so you can get a good look at the nitty gritty sleight of hand tricks that are happening. I'll also be showing you every shot from alternative camera angles so you can see how beautifully everything falls apart when you do that. And of course, I'll be providing commentary as the video goes on. My original plan had the video split in three kind of parts, the introduction, the hallway, and then the fight. Then again, my original plan also had the video be a minute and 20 seconds long, so... Well, this is the first section, the introduction. I wanted to pull off a bait and switch with the king. This is also why the video was initially called What if Queen of Pain won the Arcana vote? I wanted to trick people into thinking it was going to be about her. Unfortunately, that didn't really work out because people thought I was seriously making a case that the king should be the Arcana. Anyway, 
My regular partner in crime, Alexander Curran, whose work you have already seen in my previous short, came back and knocked it out of the park more than ever. I knew I wanted to have the Queen talk directly to the viewer from a throne room, and after all our research and discussion to narrow down my goals, we started iterating on a concept. Then she did some color keys, and I settled on the sunset-ish orange one in order to contrast with her blue skin. It also offered a much easier source of lighting to manage than torch fire, which has to be omnidirectional and that's very tricky to make an SFM. The dialogue was spliced from existing lines and it was motion captured. Yep, I acted that out in the real world. Well, I'm not too happy with how some of the arm motion came out, but all in all, it's serviceable. Something I forgot to account for is that my chair is not as wide as a throne, and I couldn't adjust the animation too much, so the throne's armorest had to be adjusted to meet me halfway, almost literally speaking. Then, as you'd expect, the mocap was heavily animated over by hand. This environment set is made of the same pieces as the hallway later on, except for the bit that stands out the most, the pillars and arched ceilings. The idea is that this place is some sort of dungeon where, perhaps, brutish mobs took as a stronghold, maybe with Rifking as their leader. The thing about this movie is that I really wanted to push my limits and go ham on what you could call world building, so none of this is a typical Dota scenario and it doesn't take place in the Dota map or anywhere near it. So all environments in the video are custom made, but some are more than others. The front room and the hallway are 100% original assets. The models are all very high poly, they're pretty much just decimated out of ZBrush and not retopologized. Not only because it's a movie, so performance doesn't matter to an extent, but also because having all this detailed high poly geometry allows the low-key grazing angle lighting to actually get caught on the edges of all this stone. Which looks pretty nice. Unlike my previous shorts, I didn't use skydomes in any way, but only cards, because they're far easier for Alexandra to make. This makes things a little bit less flexible on my end, but it's a worthwhile trade-off. In this case, I wanted to fit the background mountains in a particular way, get the largest peak aligned with the throne, so I used the pillar over there as a way to hide the seam between the card and its flipped copy. I am doing this sort of trick in a lot of instances, and if you keep an eye out, you'll keep seeing me putting conveniently placed props that reach to the top of the frame. Here's the problem though. For the lighting reasons I've mentioned before and will mention again later, the far clipping plane of the camera, that is to say, the maximum distance the camera can see, the far Z value, needs to be as short as possible. Therefore, the cards are really sticking to the cliff's edge of this room, so you can tell it's a backdrop. How to solve this? By making the cards move the exact same as the camera. In a way, it's akin to the motion matching that old school special effects artists had to do. But here, it's much more simple. I create a copy of the camera and, without touching its motion data, I move it so that its first frame matches the location of the root of the card set. The second card, the copy on the left, is locked to the root of the first one, therefore they move as a set. Then that root is locked to the movement of the copy of the camera and there we go, it looks just like a regular, infinitely far away backdrop. Obviously, all this motion transfer has to be done once the motion in question is final. Let's talk about the lighting setup in this first shot. As every set for this movie is custom made, tweaking the global light settings from scratch was a necessary step. Here, the light itself isn't used, but the ambient and specularity are. Every other light is an SFM spotlight. Now, for a quick reminder. It's usually better to use the global light source for everything whenever possible, because it's the only one that has true control over how the heroes are shaded. However, the shadow map will wrap itself around everything the camera can potentially see, so its accuracy drops off near exponentially with distance covered. SFM lights are also much more flexible, you don't have to go into the hammer map editor to edit their properties, and they also can be a real light. That is to say, you can give lights a disk-based radius, so that they don't occupy a single infinitely small point in space, giving you true soft shadows. The biggest thing to know here is that I decouple the light that casts shadows and the light that casts volumetrics. The reason for this is, I want the volumetrics to be nice and sharp, but the shadows should be reasonably softened with distance. This can't happen if I don't separate the two. Those two lights are very far away from the scene and have a very low field of view, one degree vertically and a bit more horizontally. I want to ensure that they don't cover the outside of the scene too much and really maximize the resolution of the shadow maps that way.
Then I have a few more lights, carefully placed and tweaked to fake radiosity, that is to say, the way light bounces off the ground and onto the rest of the room. And then a few more lights to highlight Queen of Pain's silhouette. Hey, you see those dust motes? They make a comeback in greater numbers later on. Much greater numbers. I hope you're ready for that. By the way, the lettering on these banners is legible. Can you figure out what it says? Last thing about this first shot, and also a bit of an SFM lesson slash reminder when I'm at it. Here at the beginning, you see an exposed change as the camera adapts to the brightness of the sunset flooding a room. Whereas this could be done directly in Source 1 SFM, this is all done in post here, because the Dota 2 rendering pipeline is not built with HDR in mind. If something is pure white, in Source 1 SFM, there is still lighting data that exists beyond that peak white point to really represent just how bright it is. While it may not be directly displayed to your screen, it's still stored on the back end. And before I can explain the difference with the Dota 2 SFM, let me explain what progressive refinement samples are. In order to render motion blur, depth of field, and area lights, the ones I mentioned earlier, for every frame, SFM re-renders it slightly differently a certain amount of times. Those are the samples. If you have four motion blur samples and a frame at 1.00 seconds, it will render it internally four times at times that cover the shutter speed of the camera, and then blend all of those together. Of course, only four samples of motion blur is very coarse in terms of temporal resolution. And for this video, I went for the maximum 256 in almost all cases. Only in a few shots did I drop to the next step down, 128. Depth of field works by moving the camera in a disc-shaped area. And, as you might expect, it's the same for a real light. The distribution is uniform, otherwise the blurring would be biased. You can see this process in action here. I've created a very powerful but very focused light and given it a large radius. This allows us to see how it gets repositioned across refinement samples. Refinement samples are also used to do jitter-based anti-aliasing as well as smoothing out ambient occlusion. Now, let's go back to explaining HDR and the lag thereof. Here is the Source 1 SFM. I'm lighting Queen of Pain with a spotlight which, in real time, is right onto her and strong enough to clip her into pure white. However, it has a large radius, so only one or two refinement samples will have the light shining onto her. Once refined, she's darker, and the light is not clipping anymore. If you try the same thing in Dolo 2 SFM though, she will appear washed out. Let's assume we have four samples for the purposes of explaining this. All the samples are, in a way, blended together and averaged. They're not additive to each other. So if we have four samples, they will contribute 25% each to the final refined image. Now remember, in Source 1, we may be seeing Akasha clipped out on our screen, but internally, lighting data exists beyond the pure white point of our screen. So when we reduce each sample to 25% of its original luminance, the data is not clipped. In Dota 2, there is no high dynamic range rendering, so there isn't anything beyond the pure white on our screen. What I've just said is not 100% technically accurate, but for most intents and purposes, this means that there are certain things that will never look as good as they would in the Source 1 SFM. If you remember how I showcased the distribution of samples earlier, with that tiny but extremely focused light, well, that's one of such cases. The amount of visual energy per sample is effectively capped in the Dota 2 SFM, so our circle will always be quite dim. In Source 1 though, it can be anything your heart desires. Here, I'm creating two of those example circles, with the right one having 20 times the intensity of the other. They both show up as pure white on our screen, but the proper amount of luminance exists internally. So once refined, the difference does show up. In the Dota 2 SFM, to reiterate, sample data only goes as far as what's represented on your screen, so both circles look the same. And practically speaking, here are examples where this limitation has affected my lighting work and resulted in images that are partially washed out. With careful planning and balancing of your lighting, however, you can make the most out of this standard dynamic range. Color grading also helps with this limitation. In the next shots, the lighting setup changes a bit. I do use the global light, and you can tell because the shadows across her face and in the background tend to jitter a bit. There is a way to mitigate this, and I do use it for a couple shots later down the line. However, I didn't consider it to be worth the effort here. 
I'll mention a little trick, I've applied it all my sets now. See, you don't have control over the global light in SFM. If you want to tweak its properties, it all happens in the hammer map editor. All you can do from SFM is toggle the shadows on and off, ramp the global lighting's intensity from 0 to 100%, all of it light, ambient and specular, as well as transition from day to night, where 0% is night and 100% is day. Day and night are just two sets of values that are arbitrarily named, and so I exploit this to control only the global light. My night in this map is just the day, but with the light off. The first shot was set to night and the others to day. The volumetric light here moves much closer and only encompasses what's visible to the camera. This is, of course, totally breaking the rules, but it allows me to have the camera clearly pass by the parts where it's secluded. So the FX stands out a little more instead of just looking like some sort of broad haze. When her wings block out the sunlight, it becomes much more clear. It was a careful balancing act to tweak the effects so that it wouldn't be too strong and would blend with the background without revealing that the volumetric was way closer to the camera than it should be. In hindsight, I do think I might have weakened it a little bit too much for the cool part of it to be visible, but at least it's still there and it's subtle, so it's not that bad of an outcome. A fun detail is that her wings are translucent, and the light and shadows received by the back show up on the other side. I'm actually not entirely sure how they set that up, as I don't believe her in-game model has one-sided geometry, but I could be wrong. I'm still doing one of my favorite tricks for wide-angle shots. After rendering a wide-angle field of view, you only need to distort it back using optics compensation. This really helps make the render feel a lot less gamey, and even a bit more movie-like. At first, there wasn't any transition to the next bit. Then I figured, since I have her raise her arm ceremoniously, that's a great excuse for a motion cut. This is the second section, the four scenes. Except, really, it's three, because the fourth one is the hallway section. The lyrics of the song describe four things. Because the last one is a skeleton choking on a crust of bread, I knew it was gonna be them killing skeleton ki I mean, Wraith King. And so, the other three ones might as well be assassinations. That's probably what they do. That's a fun couple activity, right? My original idea was to fade out all the lights in the throne room and have some sort of static set pieces fade in and out from a black void. Think something like the Dishonored endings, but going one by one. However, that proved too cumbersome, and the idea of building three minisets instead was much more appealing. Let's get to them in order. There's a king on a throne with his eyes torn out. Since Rift King is the fourth target, I had a choice between Monkey King and Sen King. But Sen King has like 16 eyes, depending on the cosmetics you're wearing, and he doesn't exactly strike me as the type to be sitting on a throne. This set was an exercise in wrangling the water shader of Dota 2. There are inconsistencies between the game and SFM, there are inconsistencies between the hero shader and the global it's simple shader which is used by the world. It's all a bit messy in an intangible way. I'm not exaggerating when I say it's intangible. Look! Things shift around based on what I'm doing in this scene. Even the color of this rock has an influence? Water is horrible, it's awful, and much like real life, it's best if you stay away from it. You see this thing above the pedestal, auto frame? It's there to block the global light's shadow on that specific area, because the global light needs to be on for water to work properly. Also, water completely ignores the existence of SFM lights, just like how the source engine ignores the sanity and psychological well-being of its users. Speaking of lights, the way the caustic effect is achieved on those volumetrics is with a gobo, more on that later if you don't know what they are, and then simply rotating the light. While it's the queen holding the dagger, it's the king holding the head. The idea is to slowly introduce him in a sneaky way, but still hidden until the proper reveal. He's in the other two environments as well, as well as in the background of some of the rapid-fire hallway shots. For this shot, however, I used a simplified version of him, because things were already pretty messy behind there as they were. There's a blind man looking for a shadow of doubt. Blind man, who's got no eyes, faceless void. He's from Clash Dream, a dimension out of time, so I figured maybe I could have these two shots set on a kind of other planet that could be in Clash Dream. But on second thought, I do have to say there are two issues with this premise. One, how would Crop and Cop get there lore-wise, and two, as much as I like how it came out, it does have vibes of a low-budget 1960s Star Trek TOS version of an alien planet, really. Though, to be fair, now that I remember, 
I had just gotten into Star Trek at the time and was binging the original series, so it was likely an influence. If every shot so far hasn't given you a clue as to how much I abuse volumetric lighting in this video, this set should definitely give you strong hints now. I experimented with getting water in there and even exploiting the water fog as heat-based fog to make it look like there was a heavy gas accumulating in pockets in the low parts of this craggy terrain. Unfortunately, none of that worked out because I needed the global light to be out. I iterated on the second shot quite a few times until I decided it would be just a lot better if I stopped trying to do something super fancy with the camera and also kept faceless mode alive, make things a bit more interesting than panning over a completely lifeless scene. There's a rich man sleeping in a golden bed. My initial idea was to have this very rich looking bedroom, but it would take too much time to model and iterate on everything. So I went the way of Scrooge McDuck. I modeled a single coin, then created a few thousand copies of it, then physically simulated that in three different ways. The scene was then populated with these three different stacks of coins. They were duplicated, rotated, scaled all over the place. It's a little silly in terms of performance. Up to 46 million triangles end up going through the pipeline. Anyway, a rich man, golden bed, it obviously calls for alchemist since it generates so much gold. And beneath his treasure is his final resting place, so it's his bed or his tomb. Euphemisms! See, that part works really well. I wish I'd found something like that for the blind man bit. Man, though, I wish I could linger on this a little longer. I think it came out looking really nice. Of course, I say that today, but in five years, I'll probably want to reach into a time machine and slap myself as I say those words. Because continuously improving as an artist is, in my opinion, a lot about constantly looking at your work from all angles and think, what could I have done better, in what ways, how, etc. Anyway, you get the idea. What makes it satisfying to have somewhat nailed on is that gold can be pretty hard to shade, and I think it came out nice not just on the coins but the atmosphere itself. The little shades of rose gold in the air, all that. Rose gold is a color with lots of associations in my head because I used to play the trumpet and my trumpet was rose gold. It was shiny and nice. I haven't played it for 10 years, but yeah. Speaking of lighting, there is an absurd amount of lights going on in the second shot. Take a look. This giant underground vault is not lit much, it's a cube map that does the heavy lifting on the coins. See what's on the coins? This compass rose symbol. I tried to have nothing on the coins at first, but it looked awful, so I figured I should at least try and add some detail. Why a compass rose? It's a nod to a game show from my childhood which has resonated through a lot of my work indirectly, as it shaped my tastes in music and my desire for… places that go beyond, just this feeling that there's something out there waiting to be explored. It's complicated to explain, but I remember talking about this feeling in general in a previous behind the scenes video. Hopefully you see what I'm getting at. This is the third section, the hallway. A lot of challenges in this part but also a lot of dust modes. Honestly, it's hard to know where to begin, but since there are so many dust modes, that's a good place to start. But even for that, I'm not quite sure where to begin. You'd think dust modes are simple, right? Well, no they're not. Just like in real life, dust is troublesome, especially if you're allergic. The particles aren't lit, they are self-eliminated. Therefore, dust modes shouldn't stray outside the light shafts. The self-elimination is constant, but the shaft is somewhat of a gradient. The difference can look weird, but it's not technically inaccurate. Consider that a dust mode is a big object, but we see the light shafts purely because the light would be hitting a billion of very, very tiny things. It's the same principle as concerts using smoke machines because they want their spotlights to create beams. Here, the hallway is filled with not only dust modes, but the air is foggy or whatever. Or maybe it's not artistic license and all that. Half the reason the dust modes are here is to create some sick bokeh. But this requires them to be big. If they're too small, they will not create sick bokeh. If they're too large, they will stand out too much and not look like dust motes when in focus. There was a careful balancing act of size as well as tweaking some very useful particle parameters that can clamp maximum screen-based size. There was also additional cheating with copies of the particle system with different sizes set, and those were used based on distance, camera aperture, etc. Okay, let's switch to talking about animation for a while. Here, you see Rifking choking as hard as I do when playing as him against Antimage. You'll note that King of Pain is still hidden and that he's the one holding him in a chokehold. 
I'm not very proud of this animation. It was quite hard to make him look like he was struggling while not moving too much, and this whole ordeal ends in a snapping motion that is not an X snap, yet it's a snap, and that doesn't make sense. But I guess it doesn't matter that much. I am, however, much happier with the right side of the frame, with Queen of Pain being solely lit by the green glow, as well as her acting in general. With the oh, you're disappointed look, followed by the sadistic face, then the smug look. This gives me an opportunity to mention that, canonically, Ref King has been trying to seduce her for a while and that he has, if you'll forgive the pun, tried to bone her since the days when he was still known as Skeleton King. The rest of the animation in this sequence are walk cycles. I don't have much to say about the kings, I just tried to make it look determined and confident. As for the queens, it was inspired a little bit by fashion cut walk. Her boots would be very uncomfortable for a human, but hey, she's probably got hooves in there. Last thing, jiggle physics. If you'll allow me to be pedantic for a moment, this is often a misnomer as very little physics are involved in these systems, in the sense of the physics engine that may be used by the game engine. Anyway, bouncing, jiggling, etc, that's fine, after all these do have weight, perhaps more than you'd expect. So there has to be some amount of secondary motion, being completely stiff doesn't look right. Likewise, there shouldn't be too much bounce, otherwise you end up with a dead or alive series. She only has one bone for both sides, but that's not an issue. Some parts were animated by hand, the rest was using this 3ds Max control setup, where the chest bone is not only using the procedural jiggle, but its rotation is also constrained to an invisible box ahead of the chest whose position jiggles with different parameters. This results in different positional and rotational animation. The idea with the next shots was to get them in rhythm with the music, switch to lots of different angles, most being fanservice-ish, and progressively sneak in shots that are in fact not the queen but the king instead, up until the reveal point. It horrendously breaks the 180 rule, I know, but it also allows me to really go wild. My favorite shot is this wide angle one from below. At 130 degrees, it might be the widest I've made yet. What I like about it is that it frames her entire body while also showing a huge portion of the scenery even though it's a very wide 2.37 to 1 aspect ratio. It also highlights her features in a nice way without being a stereotypical fan service shot. I will say though, it would have looked way kinkier had the video been in a 16 to 9 ratio. My second favorite shot is this one. It has this movie-like quality, atmosphere, look to the image, and it would make a great dialogue while walking kind of thing. Now, speaking of lighting, let's go back over all the shots and break it down. There are a lot of shots to look at, so while this is getting started, allow me to toot my own horn for a minute. I have to say I'm pretty damn proud of the lighting in this part. Remember, in this branch of the engine, there's no HDR rendering, there's no proper handling of other brightening, there's no baked lighting, and all the important shading settings on characters are global. With all that considered, I'm really glad that this is the final result. However, in my opinion, that's not even the best lighting I managed to wrangle out of the Dota 2 SFM so far. That distinction goes to the classroom in what does a hero truly fear. I think it's in that set that I've truly managed to fake global illumination and radiosity to a point where it looks convincing. You have no idea how satisfying that was, and still is. Anyway, here's how things are set up. Each window has its volumetric shaft, then its actual source of light, then another light to properly light up the edges of the window, then a fill from the bottom wall back towards the window to emulate the bounce. However, that bounce was, most of the time, severely toned down or tweaked to only illuminate the environment and leave the characters alone. The characters had a rim light each, as well as what I call the bottom bounce, a light that is exactly under them and with a large radius so that it will basically do this. You might think, why bother with shadows and radius when all I need is a solo light source from below? Well, using shadows is the only way to ensure that the light will only hit their bottom facing parts. Without shadows, the light will fully wrap around the character in a half Lambert kind of way. At first, the reveal shot was like this, but the feedback that I got was that it felt too distant, and one member in my test audience didn't even realize what was going on until the close up on his face. While I liked the contrast in that shot, and how I thought it showed how they were, well, each of our scanner part, it didn't work. So I brightened things up a bunch, and reframed them to be closer and more towards the center. That eliminated the confusion. The following shot's goal was really to crawl up his body. And that worked really well, especially the smirk. The feedback on that was unanimously good. However, 
I cut short the following shot of them side by side and replaced two thirds of its time by another shot which crawls up his body, though it's a different enough perspective to not be redundant. It also helps highlight the gem a bit. I would like to once again extend my special thanks to the women who helped me refine the first shots of the king to make them as appealing and attractive as possible. The last shot with the door came out the best of this whole section, man, I wish I managed to reach that level of movie-like treatment, and as I've said just before, that's sort of, you know, aesthetic everywhere. You might have noticed the door crack is not centered. I tried that, but it turns out visual weight and symmetry are concepts that often diverge. In fact, as I'm recording this script, one example that caught the internet's attention is the new Google logo breaking a few rules for the sake of visual weight. I think what makes it look nice is a combination of three things. One, the rim lights look really good for once, they almost look like they're out of the Source 1 SFM, which is a miracle. Two, the dust modes are there in layers, and even though there's, well, so many of them overall, they work nicely here, they don't dirty up the image, and kind of help read it by giving it depth. The way they disappear into a nice bokeh as they fly towards the camera is satisfying. Three, the lighting that leaks through is not uniform in a lot of ways, and its hue shifts with intensity. In my opinion, subtle hue shifting in lighting gives a nice feel. I love that. One of the things behind that hue shifting is also how some light shafts flood my scenes in rays. It was accomplished with the use of custom gobo textures. A gobo is, in a way, a mask for the light source. You might also think of it as a texture. In SFM1, it was possible to overlay noise on volumetric lights on top of the gobo. In fact, it was even animated. It emulated the effect of smoky air quite well. This feature is missing from SFM2. I made my own noise texture and added a bit of chromatic aberration to it. This is done by shifting the color channels a couple pixels away from each other. Controlling the sharpness of that noise, and therefore the rays, becomes a very easy process. Remember what I told you way earlier, light radius has a large effect on volumetric lights. Just adding a little bit of it blurs the gobo enough for the noise to vanish away very fast. Anyway, one last thing to bring up here with regards to lighting. Remember when I was explaining progressive refinement to you earlier? Well, you see, at maximum quality, you have 1024 depth of field samples, 256 motion blur samples, and however many are used for the subpixel jitter and aliasing. If all of those had to be rendered on their own, you'd need to apply the 256 motion blur samples to each depth of field sample. So you'd have to render 262,000 samples overall. Thankfully, SFM doesn't do this. Samples are shared across operations. However, this creates weird edge cases. While I try to minimize them, one of them appears in the background right here. When you have an areolite and depth of field at the same time, it is possible for the two to cancel each other out. Don't ask me how, all I know is that it happens. This results in out of focus shadows appearing to be way sharper than their surroundings. One way to walk around it is to tweak the radius of the areolite, but that can be problematic as you might want the large radius to get very smooth and soft shadows in the foreground. There is no one true solution to this. This is the fourth section, outside the dungeon. Unlike any previous shots I'd made in the Dota 2 SFM before, this one covers a vast amount of distance, especially vertical, and having the backdrop elements be fully in sync with the camera had the feel of an old FPS map, where you can too easily tell how different the skybox and the 3D level are. So instead, the backdrops only move about 90% like the camera in order to have a bit of parallax. That really helped, but not enough to my liking, because we were still dealing with entire backdrops, not many separate elements like in my TI6 short film Laia is mine. Three cards were the solution. And likewise, they match the motion of the camera, but not entirely. The further away something is meant to be, the more it does. The closer, the less they do. Here, hardly having volumetric lights as fog wasn't enough. The trees over here aren't lit by the setting sun, they're in the shade of the mountain. However, a certain level of light is bouncing off of the scenery and onto the trees that's ambient light. Ambient light has a directionality to it that's very diffuse, but patches of fog tend to be high frequency detail. Think of it this way, clouds really are big thick patches of fog, but in the sky. So I needed fog over there in the shade to give a sense of depth between the 3D scenery and the 2D trees. Volumetric lights wouldn't work because they're additive and can't effectively convey high frequency detail over an area. Remember? Volumetric light plus detail plus radius equals all detail gets lost. The solution was particle based fog. Much better. These subtle atmospheric effects really are a huge chunk of the atmosphere you can give to 3D environments. Just good old simplistic planar fog alone conveys distance and scale extremely well. 
In particular, I want to point out that Nintendo is a master of atmospheric particle effects, especially in the Zelda series. Fog is not something uniform, it very much has texture and variation, and the way light interacts with it is also variable to a degree. All those cliff rocks are the same model from the first act of Sealbreaker. It's a very versatile model. The dungeon itself goes quite far back as well, the throne room would be over there in the back. The last shot of this section has a sweeping vista towards the next location. I do believe I could have probably blended 2D and 3D better here, but regardless, I'm happy with it. This is the fifth section, the meadow. In the distance, you can still see the dungeon they came from. While it's minor, I love that kind of visual continuity, being able to see both places from each other. The lighting here is very simple. Global light plus two volumetrics. Much like before, they are far away so that the beams are reasonably parallel. The second one is there to create a few more rays on the right side of the frame. Now, let's talk about this map. You might remember me talking about how having uneven ground in the Dota map is impossible because it's all made with a tile-based system. If I wanted to have non-flat terrain in the Dota map, I'd have to remake it from scratch, which I will probably end up doing someday if fate pushes me towards it. Well, none of the maps in this video use this tile system, only the good old tools, and in order to place all this vegetation, I had to use the Assets Sprayer. It's a very nice tool where you define a list of models and all the different ways in which they can be placed. Do we follow the direction of the terrain? What are the bounds of the random scales and rotations they will be created with, etc. However, because it's not abstracted behind a tile-based system, every single piece of vegetation is a full-fledged prop entity. And you know me, I'm a very reasonable person, so I only have a, you know, a very small amount, you know, just 16,105 of them. When entity counts get that large, the process of spraying new entities progressively slows down to a horrendous crawl. It's bad. You might be thinking, wait a second, Max, why isn't your grass the really nice grass that we have in the Dota map nowadays? Well, I tried to figure out a way to bring that system over to regular displacement-based terrain, but it seems that the grass is completely tied to tiles. Maybe I'll figure out a way one day, or maybe, if a miracle happens, Valve will document the system. The substitute is all those grass models and bushes. They're not set up to shake with the wind, but, well, at least they're there. They make up half of the overall vegetation prop count. This is where I reuse the particle fog effect from earlier. Again, I can't stress enough how little subtle touches like this really help. The lighting setup is the same. The lights were just moved a bit to make the beams longer and more defined. So here, he actually goes along with the song, right? As if he were its singer. I mean, his face is loosely based on Sting's, so he would probably have the same voice as well. And the song is about him, in the first person, so it's as if he were the author of the song. This is part of the reason I went ahead with this project in the first place. The lyrics were flexible enough to be interpreted in a whole bunch of ways, and while the song was originally written to be about, I believe, Sting's divorce, it fits a story in a fantasy universe just as well. It's the same old thing as yesterday, something's happening again. Maybe they've been here before, but they forgot something? Okay, now, in this transition to the next section, I have to introduce the thing I mentioned earlier, multipass rendering. This is done to get around the low resolution and accuracy of the global lights shadow map when the camera's far as that plane is too far away. The trick is quite simple. The shot is rendered as usual, with a full distance camera. Then, I duplicate the camera, and on that copy, I set the far as that distance to be low enough, so that the shadows won't look garbage. And thankfully, when the background is empty, Source Filmmaker can output the void as a grayscale alpha channel. However, there are some limitations with this technique. The color of the void is still there in the image. Motion blur or depth of field will exhibit some gray edges when blending the second pass on top of the first one. I looked into this issue and this is probably something to do with pre-multiplied alpha or maybe the lag thereof. Either way, this is 95% solved by choking the mat. In summary, if you're familiar with the concept of cascaded shadow maps in games, this is kinda like doing the same thing manually and without a nice soft transition between the two. In fact, another issue to watch out for when doing this is the SSAO. It shows up at the edge of the far Z plane. However, it's easy enough to get around that. You only need to tweak the ambient occlusion settings so that the seam will be small enough to be choked out or not show up significantly in the first place. This is the sixth section, the meadow, but in the past. 
Like I said, I'm pretty much just going along with the song and trying to make something that fits it. It's the same old thing as yesterday. Yesterday, the past, long ago, you know. This building's a special card. I topologize the drawing in order to give it depth. In a way, it's the reverse of the usual modeling workflow. Instead of making a model from concept art, I made a m model from concept art? Okay, hang on. What I mean is, where the 3D model dictated what the original art would be rendered as, here it's the opposite? Yeah, I'm not sure how to describe that, whatever. The reason we did it that way is because I've had this idea in my head for a while and I've always wanted to try it. Also, it was way faster than actually modeling and texturing a building. Unfortunately, one thing I didn't realize until too late is that the building should have been drawn without perspective, in an orthogonal way. That's because the only perspective you want applied to the drawing is the one that happens once it's 3D. But if you already draw it in 3D, then the perspective happens twice, and it kinda looks off. Anyway, it's on screen for less than 2 seconds and it immediately explodes, so whatever. If you're gonna ask me to describe what's happening in terms of narrative, the idea is that there's this temple of warlock-like priests hidden in this valley, and they do demon summoning as their Sunday hobby, but this time the invocation goes wrong because they wanted a big-ass demon to chain to their will, but they got more than what they bargained for. The invocation left an evil rune or marking or whatever in the ruins of that place, and that's what the king was looking at a couple of shots ago. To further highlight that it's a different time, there are slight changes to the environment. The ground uses a different texture set. I wish I could have done something a bit more obvious like having the present meadow clearly have orange, autumn trees, versus the spring slash summer trees of the past, but unfortunately, sometimes you gotta make do with what you got. The cracks going up the building is a pretty simple trick. Using the same mesh, this time, the magical glowing cracks that signal impending doom are drawn onto the existing drawing. Then they're exported separately as a transparent texture, which is applied to a copy of the building card mesh. This copy is slightly angled away from the camera and pulled towards it across a few frames, so that it looks like the cracks are growing from the ground towards the top, instead of appearing all at once. It's the cheapest way to do it, and it's all in engine, so I don't have to do it in post, which in hindsight I could have, but perfect is the enemy I've done. The exploding rubble is a more than reasonable amount of copies of various particle systems that usually happen when the dire engine explodes as you lose 25 MMR. Both building cards are scaled down to nearly 0% and disappear under the terrain. A bunch of light appears, etc. It's all very messy. The tricky part was getting enough rubble to appear so that it would look like a reasonably plausible explosion. Unfortunately, a lot of FX in Dota, including this one, assume that they will be landing on completely flat ground, so there was a bunch of scaling, rotating and animating of all of these sets of rocks, so that they wouldn't land in mid-air, despite starting high up there. Some of these rubble explosions have an element of randomness to them too, and I got lucky that, instead of having rocks throwing themselves at the camera to clip into it, I had these cover the lower half as I refocused and zoomed, just as I hoped. The global wind properties are also animated to obscene extremes to have the trees get pushed back by the shockwave of the explosion, but it's not very noticeable. From another angle though, it's a neat effect. Now let's talk about this awful weather we're having today. Moderately strong winds, heavy rain, it's not a deadly storm but I wouldn't take a stroll outside. Okay, how does it work in SFM? Obviously particle effects, but there's something else. The global light has the ability to control not only the amount of specular that comes back from materials, but also the broadness of the reflection. This is a global control, so if it's set, all world elements take on those properties, including props. This is how everything looks wet and soaked. I based myself off of the rainy weather particles. I greatly increased the amount of pretty much everything in there and tweaked the subsystems to get the rain to look nicer from all these non-top-down perspectives. Now, if we pull back away from the camera, the magic trick is revealed. There is only rain around the camera, just a lot of it, because having the rain everywhere would absolutely murder the source engine. Thankfully, because the lifetime of a single raindrop trail is very short, it's okay for the system to be parented to the camera, even if it moves a bit fast. For example, this wouldn't be possible with snow, because while a single rain trail has a lifespan that averages half a second, a snowflake would have a lifespan of minimum 5 seconds, as they fall slowly and need plenty of time to fade in and out without it being visually obvious. 
The atmospheric fog effect from earlier makes a comeback in a modified form to emphasize wind and also represent the misty part of the rain. I wish I could have had scrolling droplet overlays on the characters, but back then, I didn't know how to override materials for existing models. Even then, I think that kind of detail may be outside the scope of the Dota Hero shader without some heavy compromises or really weird tricks. That said, the particle droplets are pretty nice as they are. They're based off of the stock particle system that is applied to characters under rainy weather, but tweaked heavily. I've also got like four different versions of it, because each character needs different properties max counts, scaling, and emitting rates. Even though particles are supposed to be able to be spawned directly on models, it turns out that either this is a broken feature or I've got to do a weird summoning ritual with virgin goats under a new moon to get it to work. Instead, they're spawned along hitboxes. Thankfully, Queen of Pain has the proper hitbox setup. I set him up manually on the king and as accurately as I could since it can be a little tricky to properly encompass all of these non-boxy shapes with boxes. The Hellstorm Golem though had these. If I wanted to fix this, I would have had to import it from scratch. Sile, the creator of that Warlock set, saved the day and provided me with the source files. On top of being able to create the proper hitboxes, the texture resolution was greatly increased and the material settings were enhanced to have nicer metal as she originally desired to have. This is also the only scene besides the blind mind set where I used the game's own sky domes. However, they are affected by fog, which I am also heavily using here. But color grading allowed me to pull out detail from the flat and grey tones. A cool thing about these sky domes, however, is that you can rotate them around manually. I do that in order to vaguely simulate the fast moving clouds of stormy weather. I simultaneously hate and love this shot. I hate the first half and love the second. The way he starts to fly is awkward and when he gets punched, it's too cartoony, but the queen flying in looks super badass. I I don't know look at this shot anymore. Anyway, I've had people ask me whether this was a reference to Shadow of the Colossus. It wasn't, at least not deliberately. It's possible that it was a subconscious influence as many things are. But I've never played Shadow of the Colossus or Ico. I did, however, play and really enjoy The Last Guardian. And I want to play Shadow of the Colossus whenever its next remake comes out. Technical trivia time. What's happening here is that the golem is scaled up, then Akasha is locked to its root transform, so she inherits its scale. So I then have to scale her down. Then the camera is locked to her root transform. But something internally doesn't like that. Manipulating transforms becomes a little weird. And because of this, I have to resort to something which is usually a last resort, splitting a shot into two. Because you see, that knife has to switch hierarchies in the middle of the shot, but doing it the usual way is pretty much impossible due to the scaling shenanigans that happen twice before reaching the knife down the hierarchy. A cool thing about SFM is that when you modify the order of transforms by locking or unlocking a transform to another, the animation will not change. However, scale is, with the exception of one weird trick that I can't remember at the moment because it's vague and counterintuitive, always inherited from the parent. Given the weird scaling things that are happening in this hierarchy, I'm sure you can imagine where this is going. So the hierarchy switch is performed across a cut and I manually matched the scale and the rotation of the knife as closely as I could across the switch. Thankfully, the particle systems played nice across the cut. When she draws back down, a happy accident occurs. All the droplets underneath her makes it look like she is splashing a lot of water upon landing. It's not something I did, it just looks that way. It also happened when the king was running towards the golem. This part where she lifts her companion off the ground is something I wanted to have since the early days of this idea floating around my head. In terms of stereotypes, it's another gender swap. In fact, this is kind of a trend of the video. At first, you think it's about the queen, then it turns out it's about the king, but then it's about her again. This is another way to give her more depth than, well, I guess she seduces people and kills them in their sleep afterwards. Like, nah, she can probably kick their ass too. I gotta say though, that scene was a royal pain to animate, no pun intended. A pair of wings is bad enough as it is, but another that has to look floppy without intersecting with the ground or both characters? This is the seventh section. It's just the ending in the present again. Technically, it's still the fifth because it's in the same file, but whatever. Remember when I keep saying that I'm really bad at estimating how long my ideas are gonna take? 
I actually almost outlasted the song, to the point that's a little awkward that you're still not supposed to be hearing what they're saying as the song is fading out. Ah well, what's done is done. Now, I didn't touch on this subject until now because I believe that this is very much a show-don't-tell kind of thing and that what's portrayed in a video should speak for itself, but hey, I'm also here to talk about as many things related to this video as possible. The thing in question is, how do these characters relate to each other? Well, they are definitely not related, but I like to think that they'd be literal soulmates. For demons, hell, I mean, demons that do what they do, I think there'd be a certain beauty in them being very loyal and loving to each other. Either way, I want to bring some humanity to them, and not just treat them as sexual objects, especially Queen of Pain. Now, before we wrap things up, I'm gonna quickly bring up every little thing that I didn't manage to work into a previous section, as well as additional questions that were sent to me for this video. And actually, it turns out the first question deserves its own section. The question in question for this section is, how long did this take you? So I figured it'd be fun to try and lay out a project timeline that's as complete as possible. But to answer the question directly, you could say two years since I got the idea around the International 2015, but of course that's not an accurate answer. Progress was really on and off, intermittent, irregular for a long time, and I only worked on it full time during the last couple of weeks. I have an extensive collection of work in progress screenshots, files and chat logs which happen to have timestamps. However, this will not be 100% exhaustive as I'm going by the traces I left. The King's model started being worked on in November 2015. Here are screenshots from between December 1st and 6th. Then the following February, he was looking like this. The face tattoos were concepted on the 15th. I started rigging him at that time. The intro mocap was recorded on March 26th. Then nothing happened for a long time. Things picked up again in the middle of October, where I got around to finishing the King's rigging. A few days later, I started looking into how I'd make the facial animation shapes. I had considered bones for a while due to the lack of blending rules, but went with morph shapes in the end. Before that could start, teeth had to be modeled by Anuxi, and that happened in early November. Then nothing happened for a while. This is how the model looked like at that point and how it would stay until early November of 2016, when the tattoos were refined a bit, and the chest ones added. In the next few days, I started actually making the first facial shapes, and also doing the first engine imports. I also started hooking up the wings and doing the weird arcing crap that comes with rescaling an already rigged mesh. Towards the end of the month, I started doing the more troublesome part of facial animation, the mouth. Then nothing until late February of 2017. I imported the mockup data that I had acted out a year prior for some basic engine previsualization. You can see here how it progressed as I reanimated over the mockup. In the middle of March, I did the eyes act for Akasha. Hey, you know who this screenshot reminds me of? Drill. And in the last few days of the month, a lot of things happened. The facial shapes were finalized, the front room set was blocked out, and I started working on walk cycles. First couple days of April, I started walking on the second section and its set. Then nothing much for a while, then I got started on the blind man set. On April 18th, this was how things were looking. May comes around, I get started on the hallway section. May 7th, this is the current draft. Then not much happens until the end of the month, which is when Anuxi started working on the environment art. Now the pace really picks up, so I'm going to narrate it a bit more like a list. June 1st, environment art is in. I start lighting it. I also look into exploding water fog in the blind mindset, but it doesn't work out. I go back to the intersection and animate Akasha's eyes. Besides polish, that was one of the last things to do animation-wise. The environment art is still missing there.
June 2nd, experimentations with giving the tattoos different shader parameters. June 3rd, animating the struggle a bit more, lighting it as well. June 5th, experiments with color gradings on the intersection. I try a couple more ideas in the blind mind scene before settling on the final one. Also starting to light the entire hallway with a defined set of lights for each window. 43 seconds are content complete, that is to say the vast majority of the work is done in all steps of the process, animation, lighting, color grading, etc. Content complete is a bit of a misnomer. After all, remember, art is never finished, only abandoned. June 6th, working on the hallways section's rapid fire shots. This is the day when I polished the gem. While tweaking the shader, this really cool looking accident happened. June 7th, the final environment art for the throne room is arriving. I start tweaking the lighting and color grading to adapt for it. June 8th, still tweaking lighting and color grading for the intro. June 9th, besides a few minor color grading tweaks pertaining to saturation of certain ranges, the intro reaches final state. June 10th, I reuse the front room's ground tile in the hallway, scaled down and flattened. All the hallway shots are in. June 11th, I noticed that when rendering at 4K, SFM2 doesn't smooth ambient occlusion at all. I look into mitigating the issue in After Effects. 60 seconds are content complete. I start building the set for the exterior of the dungeon. June 12th. Most of the work is done on that section. Here's the draft render. Notice the lack of tree cards in the first shot, as well as the unfinished vista card in the second. June 13th. I rework two shots from the King's Reveal moment after receiving more feedback. I also used the opportunity to plump up his behind a little more. June 14th, I rework his texture to highlight his Apollo's belt more. I also get started on the meadow set. June 15th, preliminary render of all present time meadow shots. You can see my first idea for the transition into the past kinda coming together. I was thinking about having a close-up on his face as lighting shifted by, then when the camera pulled away it would be the past. However, after realizing it was not a good idea, I ended up doing it the way it is now. June 17th, testing the rain in the meadows past. June 18th, replaced the transition shot with a new one. It becomes clear I'll need to figure out a new way to tackle the inaccuracies of shadows. Still not sure what the monster they're gonna fight should be. Then, I see the awesome Hellstorm Golem again, and I realize it's the one. June 19th, Meadow Explosion Previous. June 20th, 1 minute and 25 seconds are content complete. Messing around with a cool sweeping shot idea. I discovered that a certain combination of parameters on the hero shader prevents fog from being applied to the material, and while I didn't use this newfound trick in this video, I did use it in my TI-7 short film. June 21st, making this cool threatening shot of the golem. Then realizing that it would make a lot more sense if he was showing off some cool magical powers. Then also realizing that it would be a lot better if he faced left, because when the king walks towards him, he is facing right. That way, they'd face each other, and it would look more confrontational. The shot was already done, so I flipped it in editing. June 22nd, animating the bit where the queen picks up her boy off the ground. June 23rd, same. June 24th, making the ending section. June 25th, finishing the golem fighting shots and releasing. You might have noticed, towards the very end, information got more sparse. When making a little bit of progress ever so often for so long, it makes sense to share it, screenshot it, make draft renders, all traces that I could go by to establish a timeline. But when things were at their busiest, that didn't happen. What I do remember, however, is that the two pieces that were missing until the last moment were this shot, as well as the queen up on the golem's face. 
Anyway, I hope you found that timeline interesting. Do you do storyboards? I can't draw and I picture everything in my mind, so I don't have much use for them. Storyboards are great and sometimes necessary for team collaboration, but I worked alone. The teams that I get together to help me on my movies are there for custom assets. Besides, when it comes to work that is derivative like this, and also takes place inside a game engine, you could argue storyboards aren't as useful as it'd be in an environment where everything is made from scratch. You know what I mean? How would King of Pain sound when he screams? So yeah, in summary, I listened to a song. I thought the lyrics were cool and could fit a fantasy universe such as Dodas. I wanted to bring a bit of personality to these characters. I wanted to make something a little subversive, and I liked the challenge of seeing a character through the completion from the very beginning to the very end. I hope you enjoyed this labor of love, and if you didn't, I still hope you enjoyed this breakdown video. If you have any questions that I didn't cover here, please feel free to ask in the comments. I'll do my best to answer. See you next time!